welcome Professor Larry Dell. Thank you, Maria, and thank all of you for coming out today. I uh, wish I was on the sunny side of the plaza like you are. To tell you the truth, it's pretty cold up here. Now, along with my graduate students, I've been studying sea lice for about five or six years. And my own particular research interest is in how sea lice affect the behavior, how sea lice affect the behavior of... Great, that's good of juvenile salmon in ways that might make them more likely to be killed. In the process, I've had the opportunity to see the situation in the Broughton Archipelago firsthand, and I've read most of the literature on sea lice, and so I guess I've earned somehow the uh, sobriquet of being an expert on sea lice and salmon. And I'm an independent scientist. I think one of the interesting distinctions between what's happening here in BC and what happened on the East Coast with salmon is that it was the DFO scientists themselves who are warning of dangers. Here on the West Coast, it seems that it's been up to the independent scientists to do this rather than those who work for DFO. Now, as a result of the experiences I've had, I have become absolutely convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that sea lice pose a very serious risk to the survival of our wild salmon population. This is amply documented by all of the excellent science that's been published in some of the best uh, refereed journals in the world, worked by people like Alex Morton, by Martin Krakosik, and others. And of course it should have come as no surprise to us because we know that everywhere in the world where open net aquaculture is practiced, there have been negative effects on wild salmon populations. Now in addition to that work, some unpublished recent work by my collaborators and students and myself have shown that the situation is probably even more dire than we have supposed. We've learned, for example, that parasitized juvenile salmon do not swim as fast as unparasitized ones. They take greater risks to get food because they need it, because of their uh, loss of energy to these parasites, and they don't school as well as unparasitized fish. They tend to hang around the periphery of schools, in the back and on the edges, and as a result, they're much more likely to get eaten by predators and end up in a predator's gut. Now this is not the sort of result that one would have found or could have found by putting fish in tanks and saying, well, they're able to survive sea lice, they shuck them off, they develop an immune response, they're just fine, don't worry about it, which is what DFO tells us. But the problem is that these parasitized fish may well get eaten by predators before they ever have an opportunity to develop an immune response and shuck off the sea lice. So I'm predicting that we're going to find that there are myriad other indirect and direct ways in which sea lice have an impact on wild salmon. Now as far as the Fraser sockeye go, we simply do not know the role that sea lice and fish farms may have played. It's entirely possible that they are a causative agent. There are some intriguing um, hints that suggest that this might be true, and Alex Morton mentioned one of them earlier. But the science that would support that has really not been done yet. However, just as it would be inappropriate for me as a scientist to stand up here and say that sea lice caused the disappearance of 9 million Fraser sockeye, it is just as inappropriate for bureaucrats and senior officials at DFO to say that they're not involved, because we just don't know. It is also inappropriate to say, as Minister Shea has, that the population decline is coast-wide and applies to all species and populations. It is emphatically not coast-wide. It emphatically has not affected all populations. And even the other stocks that have declined have not declined nearly as much as the Fraser Saka. So clearly something is going on there. Furthermore, any population decline, as any ecologist knows, is bound to have myriad causes, perhaps acting simultaneously. And just because we might be able to identify one cause, ocean conditions, for example, 
doesn't mean we should ignore other possible causes, particularly when those other possible causes are things that we could do something about, like closed containment aquaculture. So based on what they've been saying, senior people in DFO are one of three things. Extremely ignorant, misinformed, or they're lying to us. And none of these things are good, are they? I mean, we wouldn't want our senior officials to be any of those. DFO is a seriously sick agency. And it's been a seriously sick agency for a very long time. And it's not simply because of their response to the Sockeye tragedy. It's not simply because they have to be taken to court by NGOs to follow the regulations of the Species at Risk Act. But it's because of their constant kowtowing to industry. And not just the agriculture industry, but other industries. They have become, to my mind, the worst example of a captured agency. In my naive view, I always believed that governments work for the people. I thought this is what civil servants actually meant. But they no longer seem to work for the people of BC and Canada. DFO needs to be completely overhauled. And I urge you, and you should urge all of your friends, to write your MP, write to the Prime Minister, to do just that, to demand a judicial inquiry into DFO's behavior, or should I say misbehavior. And of course, you should also demand that salmon aquaculture move to closed containment, because it's entirely possible. Don't let them tell you anything else. And finally, keep coming to rallies like this, keep supporting the wild salmon, and don't eat that farm stuff. Thank you very much.